Professor Robert King gives a fascinating talk on mangroves. Although Sydney only has two mangrove species, there are around 40 species in Australia, with northern areas host to most. The term mangroves describes an ecological category of plants, many families of which are related to more well-known garden plants. Okay, so if you live in the Sundarbans in, um, in India, um, on the Bangladesh border, um, five people have been eaten by tigers in the mangroves since um, April this year. Not, not doing quite as well as, um, as COVID, but well on the way. As far as I'm concerned, mangroves are beautiful um, and they do provide a terrific um, habitat to enjoy. Now, I'll be quite upfront about the photographs. Most of the photographs are mine. Um, some of them are from Norm Duke, who's Australia's real expert on the distribution of mangroves. And someone was talking before about the mangroves in Carpentaria um, being um, destroyed, if you like, and dying off a few years ago. Norm Duke was the person who identified that and did most of the work. So some of the photographs are Norm's. The first photograph and the last photograph, though, are to show you how beautiful mangroves can be. And indeed, in order to, um, to make a better uh, image for mangroves, there is such a thing as a mangrove photographic competition. So if you've got some really good photographs of mangroves, um, enter them in that competition. As Sue said when we started, and thank you, Sue, for setting it up for me, um, mangroves um, are either an ecological category of plants, and some people then prefer to use the term mangle, um, and, can, and there are all sorts of trees, shrubs, palms, even a fern that grows in the intertidal zone in marine and estuarine areas. So it's an ecological category of plants. It's not a taxonomic category. It's also a vegetation type. And so we talk about mangroves as being uh, vegetation type dominated by mangrove species. It's hardly um, enlightening to do that, I know. But um, you do need to recognise that sometimes I'll be talking about mangroves as a, as a plant and sometimes I'll be talking about plants and sometimes I'll be talking about mangroves as a plant community. Um, as a plant community, there, most, most um, classifications of plant um, associations uh, given in structural terms, generally how, how widely spaced things are, how much um, of a crown they have. There's a rough measure of, um, of I guess, um, capacity and pr productivity. But they occur as low shrublands. And um, the photograph in the lower left shows my dear brother, who's older than me, and I... Um, at the lowest or the southernmost um, extent of mangroves in Australia, at Wilson's Promontory. And um, there it's a low shrubland. Plants are well spaced. Um, at the top on the left, there's the same species but forming a beautiful woodland. Um, they can form rainforests if you define rainforests by, by a community which is, um, has a crown that's very structurally intact and um, dense. So the mangrove environment, as, as Sue said at the beginning, is variable and very often high salinity. And as she said, I started my, um, my work on mangroves in a very strange way. I was to work on, I was working on marine algae, and I should have said macroalgae, not microalgae, seaweeds, um, around the Victorian South Australian and um, Tasmanian coastline. And then I went to northern Germany because there was a famous professor there who studied mangroves in South America, and I was going to join his project. Uh, he must have heard I was coming because about two weeks before I got there, he died of a heart attack. And so he, um, so I started work on other things. But one of the uh, interesting things is there was a very... Um, unknown marine botanist called Erica Post, who lived in Schleswig-Holstein in northern Germany, um, and she worked on mangrove algae. Um, and she, she didn't get any recognition because, let's face it, 
people were mostly interested in vegetation that grew at the, at the back door, and there weren't all that many marine biologists in the tropical regions at that stage. She worked in the 1920s, 1930s, and so on. But I got interested in this because of the capacity of the plants that grow in the mangrove area, mangroves themselves, to grow in an area of very often um, variable and high salinity. If you look at the mangroves on the northwest coast of New South, uh, um, Australia, they're often in places that in very hot, dry days, low tide, very low tides, there'll be salt crystals on the ground even. Next thing you know, there's a tropical downpour in these same plants uh, in an area that's more or less fresh water. Um, and I studied that aspect in some of the seaweeds. The sediment is often waterlogged, well, it is waterlogged, and it's often anoxic. In other words, it's, that's what the smell comes from. Um, the sediments are unstable, and most plants like to grow in stable sediments. And the plants are exposed to the mechanical effects of wave action or tide action. Um, particularly on Western Australian coast where they get macro tides sometimes up to 10 metres or so. The adaptations to living with salt are many and various. Um, there are, there's exclusion of the salt. Um, there's reduced water loss, and that's sometimes associated with succulents. Salt-laden parts, and some of you, if you've ever been down to the mangroves around, well, you must have been at some stage, around um, the Hawkesbury or around Botany Bay or somewhere, you'll often see salt crystals on the surface of the leaves. They've got glands in the leaves that excrete salt. Give the, give the plants a lick, probably, and you'll see how salty they are. I wouldn't recommend it if you're too close to the airport. Um, they can avoid the toxicity. They can secrete the stuff through salt glands. Um, they can sometimes shed the salt-laden parts, and that's more common in salt marsh plants than in mangroves. Um, and they show viviparity sometimes, and viviparity refers to the fact that the seeds germinate on the plant. Now, of course, people say that so that they can avoid the um, the environment to which they're going to um, in which they're going to become established, and they attribute this to the plant, knowing that it's going to avoid those sorts of things. Um, but anyway, viviparity is often there, and they often have big and or large propagules. Um, rather than the plant producing seed, which falls off and grows some and goes somewhere else, then they they actually have large, very large seeds, often germinating, and they can float around in the water and be there for long periods. The adaptations to unconsolidated and anoxic sediments give rise to what we probably think of when we think of mangroves. Um, they have a shallow root penetration. Not much point in um, being down in the area that's completely without oxygen. They often have support structures such as buttresses and stilt roots, and they have breathing roots or full of air and chyma, full of air space tissue um, in nematophores. Um, now, nematophores, are, <laughs> I saw in one book recently, and so you had a book you were holding up before about mangroves. They called nematophores negatively geotropic adventitious roots. Look, I prefer to think of them as just um, nematophores. It's an easier way of doing it. They often have stilt roots and knee roots, and these often have the capacity to um, take gases in through, um, through the structure. Um, so in Abyssinia, and look, I'll talk about Abyssinia a lot. Abyssinia is the, the common mangrove around Sydney. Um, there are two mangroves around Sydney. Um, but the common mangrove around Sydney has a main stem. You can see it on that slide. The top, extensive um, cable roots, then um, an extensive mat of roots at the top surface, feeding roots, and these nematophores that take oxygen down, and then some vertical anchor roots. The rhizophora, sorry, the, um, the mangrove that you'll see if you're ever watching movies about that are set in mangrove swamps, um, they will always be of something like rhizophora with these stilted roots. Um, and you can see those on here, the stilt roots. Again, the nutrition roots at the top and the anchoring roots. These very extensive root systems help to, um, help to hold the plants in a very soft sediment. Um, you can see Abyssinia here, which is um, 
the most common one. This one's taken down near Botany Bay, and you can see, I hope you can see, that there's just lots of these finger roots up, and it means you can walk on them. Um, I suppose some people might think this is a dreadful thing to do, but you can see here in this slide, you can see the, the nematophores sticking up, but you can see they're mostly in straight lines, and this is because they're coming from the underground cable roots. Um, Rhizophora then with the stilt roots, again, um, able to anchor the plants very well. I'd just like you to notice in the middle of the screen, there's some young plants there mm -hmm. growing up. Um, they're about probably about 30 centimetres high, and um, later on I'll be talking about those. Uh, some of them have these flint flanges for roots, a bit like, a, bit like uh, a fig, really, um, and they are supposed to stabilise plants in these, again, anoxic environments. They um, take in gas through those buttress roots. Okay, um, as I said, we generally associate mangroves with prograding shorelines or shorelines that are accumulating sediment. Um, there's places where they don't accumulate sediment. If you take the ferry from, um, sorry, the river cat up, to, up the Parramatta River, you'll see there that the, um, <laughs> the shoreline, which was actually until they started using river cats, they used to have to clear it every now and then for ferries to go up, and up there. Um, it's now being pushed back um, because of the um, wash from the ferries. But they can grow on sand on the left-hand side of this photograph. Um, they can also grow occasionally on rock and crevices in rock. Um, so long as they can get anchored, um, the one on the right is taken on Cape York a couple of years ago. The geographic distribution of mangroves in Eastern Australia, just to give you some idea, they are essentially tropical. Victoria, one genus, Avicennia, um, just called the gray mangrove. And Avicennia is found all the way around through the around the world. You'll even find it in the in the um, Middle East. Um, Central New South Wales, we have two Avicennia, the grey mangrove, and we have Agesiris, which is called the river mangrove, because it tends to grow further up the rivers, um, and it turns it tends to grow inland of the Avicennia. But if you go to northern New South Wales, there are six um, genera and six species. Um, if you go to southeast Queensland, it suddenly jumps to 13 uh, genera, 14 species. And by the time you get to Cape York, there are 23 species, sorry, 23 genera and 40 species. They're generally reasonably easy to identify. Um, Norm Duke has produced a terrific book on the mangroves of Australia and the identification, but there are a, a lot of hybrids. I can also say, though, that... Um, they, there must be more to discover. Um, and only a couple of years ago, a naturalist um, found a new species on Cape York, right in the middle of other things. So, you know, there's a chance next time you're on Cape York or going around northern Australia to um, find a mangrove that no one's found before and you can name it after your president. Um, the local distribution is, is influenced by various factors, the local topography and the inundation regime. Um, on the east coast of Australia, the tidal range is generally somewhere between about 1.4 and about 2.8 metres. Um, on the west coast of, of um, Western Australia, as I said before, macro tides up to 10 metres in tidal heights. If you've ever been to some of those places, they hold their race meetings for horse, horse racing um, at, low, at low tide in periods of um, neap tide, sorry, when the range is smaller because the up, upside area of the salt marsh they use as the racetrack. Um, it's influenced by salinity upstream and downstream. Um, sometimes people have terrific jobs, and I had a terrific job for a long time. Um, and we, for instance, did a survey of the mangroves upstreams in, um, in northern Queensland and all sorts of places. Good fun. Did the same in Mexico, incidentally. So there's all sorts of options. Opportunities. It depends on the substratum, generally found on loose sediments. Um, there was a famous book 
written by Eric Bird, a, a physical geographer, um, published in about the 1960s, I guess, about mangroves as land builders. And um, I know that some people on the in the coastal saline lagoons between here and Newcastle um, have tried to grow mangroves down at the bottom of their garden because if you can grow them well enough, they'll accumulate sediments and you can increase the size of your property. I don't know whether it's going to increase the value of your property, but anyway, uh, there are some things. There's, a, there's clearly a borderline between um, what's a mangrove and what's not if you define it by by the um, geographic range. Um, here we have Barringtonius. I don't know, somebody might later tell me that they've grown a Barringtonius successfully in Sydney, but I think it's a terrific tree. But if you go up the Daintree River right to the top, the last plant that some people would call a mangrove is Barringtonia, powder puff tree. Um, some people would say that's the indication that they actually reach land. Um, the beach hibiscus, I don't know whether where you live it's common, but round, round Randwick and particularly down at Coogee, uh, the beach hibiscus is a commonly planted tree in the streets. Um, it's, a, it's just an ordinary hibiscus um, and it is generally regarded as, as a mangrove when it grows in mangrove areas. When it doesn't, it's regarded as a street tree. Uh, I'll just go through the, the family. So I've chosen to do it this way because you can think about the plants that are related to um, your mangrove species. Aracariaceae, palm family, 187 genera, 2,500 species. There is one mangrove representative um, and there's one species and that's Nipah, um, Nipah fruticans. It's the mangrove palm. Very common throughout Southeast Asia, um, but um, these photographs, um, especially the, the bottom one, that top one's taken in New Caledonia. The bottom one is taken in Northern Australia. Very uncommon in Australia, um, but it does occur. Um, the next one I want to show you is from the Acanthaceae. Um, a family with 240-odd and 4,000-plus um, plants. So you'll probably know acanthus as, a, as an oyster plant. I guess most of you would regard that as a weed. Um, I should say that I grew up with a family that was very interested in Australian plants. We had about four acres of Australian plant garden in Victoria, and... Um, at one stage, we only had one non-native plant in the garden, and that was a that was an oak tree. And my brother and I refused to help my father cut it down because we used to like climbing in it. But um, acanthaceae is generally got a few few things that might be regarded as weed species, but you might have them in your garden. Oyster plant, and um, the fire spike is the is the most common thing around this area of Sydney. Um, Acanthaceae also includes Graptophyllum illicifolium and another Graptophyllum, which I can't remember the name of. I have only one plant of each in my garden and they're not doing very well. But if anyone in the question time can tell me where you can buy them, please let me know. They're not in the um, Encyclopedia of Australian Plants, which is surprising to me um, because they're such a beautiful plant. Um, there's one in, the one in, of this particular species in the front garden is um, flowering very well. Excuse me, right. Robert. I believe we have them in our um, shade house, the North Shore Group, for sale. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you about how I do that. <laughs> okay. Um, another one that's common enough as a weed and sometimes found in the back of mangroves is this giant salvia. I don't know whether anyone knows that one. Grow it very easily, but... I put that one in simply because it looks a bit like this one. There are mangrove representatives, and one of them um, is acanthus. And this is acanthus illicifolius, a spiny, holly leafed mangrove. Um, a rather beautiful plant, grows at the upper end, end of the um, range, at the higher, slightly higher elevation. But the interesting thing to me is that there are three species. And I have to say, I've only seen one or 
Alternatively, I've seen all three and haven't noticed the differences. Um, but the Avicennia is with eight species is also in the Acanthaceae, which is very unusual, I think. Avicennia, as I said before, it's a common one. Salt crystals on the leaves, you can see there beautifully. Flowers that don't really look like an Acanthaceae at all. Um, but with the nematophores, you can see, again, the tendency for the nematophores or these um, little finger-like root projections to be in lines that correspond to the, uh, to the uh, main anchor roots. So very, very straightforward plant and lots of it around Sydney. Uh, Avicennia um, produces very large fruits. And um, the skins are quite tough and leathery, but inside you find these that the, the plant actually starts to germinate inside the, the seed coat, sorry, the fruit coat. Um, and you can see on the left hand, somewhere on the right hand side, um, the dicotyledons from the plant and the um, radical or the initial shoot, the initial root. Um, there are some in the Euphorbiaceae, and I just put these in to remind you how ugly, ugly but also interesting euphorbs can appear to be. Um, the Euphorbiaceae is a giant family, 6,500 plus species. Uh, give or take a few hundred or probably a few thousand, depends on the taxonomist that's got at the, at the group lately. Um, but you'll know them. And what's the characteristic feature of Euphorbiaceae? When you break it open, it exudes white sap, sap. And that sap is very nasty. And for that reason, whoops, sorry. Um, for that reason, the mangrove that there is, of which there is only one um, in the Euphorbiaceae ex coacaria. Um, Oh, that's a funny thing to do. I'm not doing that. Um, the ex coacaria um, has a very nasty white sap. Um, it's reputed to have been used by First Nations people as a poison on the ends of spears for fish, um, and it's known as blind eye. Um, the really very nasty sap produced by that particular one. Okay, we'll go to the next family is the Lithraceae, which is the loose strife family. Um, and um, uh, I've put the picture in of the person as a, um, what's the fruit? The person oh, pomegranate. Pomegranate, pomegranate in, simply to show you how much like the pomegranate fruit is the um, fruit of the only member of this group um, to appear. And here it is. Um, Sorry, that's in the one species, Sonoratia. So it's a very similar sort of fruit, very large fruit, um, beautiful plant. There are two genera, Pemphis and um, on Sonoratia. Um, quite common in the mangroves in northern Australia and very beautiful. And then we come to the Malvaceae. Um, and I've, or the hibiscus family, the mallow family. Um, and of course, there's plenty of um, Australian examples. I don't know whether any of you have grown the, the um, Northern Territory floral emblem very well. Um, this one, um, which grows in Northern Australia, and of course, geraniums, or whatever you want to call them. The Malvaceae has um, a mangrove representative. There's a thing called Campus Demon, and it has, it, it, they were formerly in the Bombaceae. Bombacaceae. It's um, one of the interesting things. It would have been terrific to be Joseph Banks and um, Solander and those sorts of people and come to Australia and just give a new name to every plant you found because you probably thought no one else had found it before. I can call it what I like. Um, now, of course, if you want to identify things, 
um, it's it's a bit more difficult. Um, but many of the mangroves were given um, specific names and put in families even of their own um, because nobody thought to put them in an ordinary plant family, um, a, higher pl a, a, a land plant family. And that's certainly the came, case with Campus Demon. There are three species. Um, it has flanged roots or buttress roots, but it also has these very strange knobbly roots and it has the most amazing root system where the roots just keep on emerging from the substrate. We now go to um, Ameliaceae, the mahogany family. Um, we all know about mahogany. Um, uh, we know about the Ameliaceae anyway, um, with red cedar. And um, it's, it surprises me, I guess, that there is a, um, a representative of that in the um, mangroves, among mangroves. And this is Ameliaceae mahogany family, um, Xylocarpus, two species. This is called the mangrove, um, the man or cannonball mangrove. That doesn't really give an impression of size because you can't tell how big the leaves are. These leaves are quite large, so the, the plant is, uh, the, the fruit can be up to about 15 centimetres across. Um, when they fall, they come down with a mighty crash, uh, but they're very large fruits. Um, and the fruits can float. And one of the reasons that said that the mangroves are generally, most of the genera are widely distributed throughout the tropics is because the fruits can float really easily. I know there's always stories about um, coconut, uh, coconut um, fruits floating and germinating in other places, but it's certainly the case that the Xylocarpus does that. Um, somewhat surprisingly, um, the Myrtaceae is also represented. Um, it's a big family. And of course, we know hundreds of examples of that that you've all probably got in your gardens. Um, and um, I'm just particularly fond of the tree waratah. Uh, but this one is just the coastal tea tree, Leptospermum levigatum. And um, and I've just put that photograph in there to say that the Myrtaceous example that occurs in the mangroves um, is on Osbornia, and it sometimes just looks like a tea tree growing at the back of the mangrove area. There's not much of Osbornia in Australia, um, but I have seen plenty of it in um, New Guinea on the northern shores New Guin in New Guinea. Um, primulaceae, well, I couldn't resist putting in a picture of the primulas, but the one on the left with the scribble all over it, um, you might know of Somolus repens or brookweed, uh, grows on salt marshes around Sydney. It's probably the only um, widely distributed member of the primulaceae in the Australian um, flora that's uh, naturally in the Australian flora. Um, so here it is, um, plenty of it, um, and Aegisirus, that is, the river mangrove. And as I mentioned before, um, the river mangrove occurs um, in Sydney um, at the upper reaches of the um, Hawkesbury, um, grows in Botany Bay, but generally to the higher, end, see, to the landward end of the mangroves um, in Botany Bay particularly. Um, here's an example um, of a plant that was for many years um, in the um, family um, Aegisiritaceae. So as I said, if you were a Banks or somebody around about that time, you just gave the name to the plant. You, preferably if you were a Banks, you called it after yourself, um, but you um, gave the name to the plant and then you um, just put it in a separate family. And you're pretty safe to do so because no one else had ever seen Aegisirus and you could get away with it. Um, it was in, formerly even in the Mercenaceae. And one of the things that's happened in the most recent time is the, the fair amount of juggling around of species. It probably drives you mad as well as it drives, drives me mad um, because 
we're finding out more and more from genetic sequencing and so on um, what things are really related to one another. It's not the answer to everybody's prayer, um, of course, and I heard you talking earlier about some of you were talking about um, orchids and the change of names, and you'll know that some people um, have tried to take Terrastylus, and I think they divided it up into 16 different genera. Um, I'm pleased to say that um, neither the Melbourne Herbarium nor the um, Sydney Herbarium have agreed with that, and Terrastylus remains, from my point of view, still Terrastylus. Okay, so here's that same one again. Again, salt excreted from the leaves in large crystals. Um, just a pleasant plant altogether. And again, this happens to varying degrees how much the plant produces a seed um, or a seedling um, or a large fruit. That's the dispersive unit. The typical mangrove family is the Rhizophoraceae. The um, Rhizophora itself, um, the stilt mangroves. Um, let me just say that um, Rhizophoraceae is known as the mangrove family, uh, but it's not necessarily all found in mangroves. So here's a thing called Crossostylus, which I don't think anyone's ever grown in Australia, but it's in the Rhizophoraceae. And in this particular case, it's growing in New Caledonia and um, it's growing in a swampy area that's relatively close to the sea and where there's a reasonable amount of salinity. But nonetheless, it's genuinely not a mangrove. It's, it's in the adjacent rainforest. For the Rhizophoraceae, there's Rhizophora, the stilt mangroves, there are three species. There's Brugeria, the orange mangroves, and there are six species, um, and Cereops, and then there's one called Candela. There are two species, but they're not found in Australia. I think I said before there were about, I forgot what the figure was, was it 30 or 40 different mangroves in northern Australia, about 40, I think. Um, I did do some work in the mangroves in northern New Guinea, and that was good fun because um, when you're in New Guinea, the locals are really interested in what you're working on and why you would want to work on them. And they just assume that they must be particularly valuable. And I was trying to get out of the people that I was living near why they thought mangroves were valuable. And they had all sorts of reasons why they were valuable. And they and I said, and I think I've found all of the all of the mangroves that are in your area. And um, they said, no, no, you haven't. And um, and I said, well, I think I have. And then there was that crisis of confidence when they say, we'll take you out an outrigger, um, but you have to pay us with some cigarettes. And I think that's always, at that stage, I was a member of the anti-smoking group in Sydney and um, I didn't feel comfortable with that, but nonetheless, I bought a few packets of cigarettes for the first time in my life and you deal them out one or two at a time. And these people showed me and I said, but there's this, there's, you know, one mangrove that, they said, when I said we've seen everything on the list, they said, ah, but there's one more. And they said, and they said they um, could show it to me. And as I said, they extracted a few more cigarettes from me. And um, it turned out that the person who they, who'd done the mangrove um, census for Northern New Guinea hadn't given them enough cigarettes. So they just kept one behind and didn't show him where it was, which I thought was delightful. Okay, so here are the um, stilt mangroves, and you can see the stilt roots, but you can also see they have adventitious roots that come right down, whoops, come right down from the stem. Um, and um, so there are both, and therefore you can get trees that extend and extend, um, and a bit like, um, a bit like um, ficus, you know, they just keep growing out and, um, here they are, and here's a really good example where the fruit is on the tree on the right-hand side. You can see the, the um, flowers, and then you can see the developing flower buds on the, um, on the left, and the leaves are slightly fleshy, and um, there's this hint of salt glands on those leaves. But on the right, you can see the plant with the fruits, which are really well-developed, 
and then the germination takes place on the tree. And when they're really well developed, these fruits can be 20 centimetres or more long and they just drop off the tree and sometimes in very soft sediments, they will um, just root there as um, where they happen. I showed you one before and I said, keep in mind where these um, young plants are developing. Um, in places in, um, in Iriomote Imshigaki, in very far south of Japan, somewhere near Taiwan, you can see Taiwan from the islands at the bottom end of um, Japan. It's a, about a thousand kilometres from Tokyo down to Okinawa, and then another thousand down to Iriomote. Um, they have they employ the local kids to wait until these are really germinating well, but before they fall, and they collect them, and they're um, trying to regrow their mangrove swamp because. Um, there was a lot of damage done by hurricane at one stage. Um, Brugeria, well, I just want to show you again on the right-hand side, you can see a big fat um, developing seedling hanging from the calyx of the fruit. Um, and it's, um, there are six species in Australia. They're probably the most difficult ones to identify. That covers all the mangroves essentially in the Australian environment. Um, and as I've said before, uh, Norm Duke, Norm Duke has written a terrific book on the identification, which has a lovely slip-in um, guide, which is sort of a series of concentric wheels. And so it says, you know, flowers, or it says something about the leaves, and that gets you down to one lot, and then it gets down, and gradually as you go towards the, um, the centre of the circular disc, you get down to one species. Um, this is the Amayima mistletoe. It's like all mistletoes. It mimics the plant that it's growing on. Um, and this is Epiphytica on Rhizophora. And you would, you're battling to see the difference, except that the leaves are slightly, um, slightly less green, slightly less chlorophyllous. Um, as you might expect for something that's fully epiphytic on Rhizophora. Mangroves can also be the habitat, as I mentioned before, for ferns. Um, and this Acrostichium speciosum is the, called the mangrove fern, and it can be very, very common indeed in northern Australia. But much more interesting, you can get a Myrmecodia, the spiny ant plant. And again, I wonder if anyone's ever tried growing them or the capacity to grow them as a garden plant. They'd be fantastic if you could, but probably, probably nobody would want you to bring the ants down. Incidentally, there are other ant problems. There are ant problems with mangroves if you're <laughs> if you're working in them like I've been sometimes, and it's a very hot day, and you're covered with um, covered with overalls to keep the mosquitoes off and it's hot and it's sticky and you brush through a green ant's nest and they all go down inside the boiler suit. Oh, <laughs> not the most pleasant experience. Well, I said to you before that um, I worked on the, uh, the algae that grow on mangroves. They're almost, almost the same. Well, they are the same few genera around the world and... Um, just in case you think that's a blue alga, because if it was, people would be trying to extract the gene out of it so that they could grow roses that were blue. Um, but the, the rest are just how beautiful red algae can be. And I'd just like to remind you that the ultimately um, higher plants come from the sea um, in an evolutionary sense. Um, if there's higher plants in the sea, like sea grasses, of course, they're ones that have come out of the sea as probably as algae or something in an evolutionary sense, higher plants that have gone back to the sea because they don't like what they found. Um, mangrove exploitation, protection and management. Well, it's direct use, and the best examples of that would be um, using them for canoe parts and um, things like that in New Guinea. I was amazed at how many different mangroves were being used for different parts of the canoe. Um, there's the so direct use, there's not that much direct use. 
um, because they don't grow very often in straight stems or anything, and the wood is generally fairly soft. Um, the indirect use, of course, is that mangrove areas are the nursery grounds for um, many fish, um, for harvesting fish, for crustacea. If you watched um, David Attenborough recently, he was showing some mangrove swamps in which there were um, small crocodiles, which were being protected because um, crocodiles are known to eat their own young. Um, but plenty of crustacea. Um, and if you look at, um, at areas around Sydney, it's not that many good examples now, but certainly in other places there are of um, Aboriginal kitchen middens. And there, there's lots of um, crustacea and um, particularly mollusks, which have their origin in the local mangrove swamp. As I mentioned, they're nursery grounds. Um, they're often regarded as a good water filtration system. Um, but one of the most important things is that they stabilise coastlines. And if you look at um, the, some of the developments in Southeast Asia for um, mariculture, you can see what damage can be done when you, um, when you mess around with a mangrove swamp. So these indirect uses that are here are a really good example. They're nursery grounds. They're places where you can harvest these things. If they're good nursery, if they're good places to harvest the fish and so on, then maybe they'd be really good to pull all the mangroves out and, um, and grow prawns or oysters or something like that. And when you do that, you destabilise the sediment um, and, um, and they, you just lose it. Um, but most particularly, and you can see this again on, in recent um, documentaries on television, there have been some really good examples where the mangrove stabilises the coast, you remove the, co you remove the mangroves to build the mariculture facility, there's no protection from the storms and storm surges and so on can get well inland and, um, and wipe out the rest of the adjacent mangroves as well. Oops, so that the last photograph is another photograph to show you how beautiful mangroves can be. They can be absolutely fabulous in the right light. Um, and if you look at that and think it's all going to be very pleasant, just think about mosquitoes, think about um, all the other um, inconveniences of working in mangroves. But um, very beautiful indeed. So that's probably all I need to say that uh, if people have got questions, I'm very happy about that. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and view other great content? New videos being added all the time.